Let's talk about John Wellborn Root, the North American today, uh, still 19th century, but uh, a very different kind of architect from Philip Webb. And it's actually almost amazing if you compare the works of Philip Webb, an European, with the works of John Wellborn Root, who already announced the, the mega structures of the United States. Uh, so John Wellborn Root was an American architect who was based in Chicago with Daniel Burnham. They worked together, they had an office together. He was one of the founders of the Chicago school style. Two of his buildings have been designated a National Historic Landmark. Others have been designated Chicago Landmarks and listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 1958, he was posthumously awarded the AIA, the American Institute of Architects um, uh, Gold Medal. Medal. He died very young, uh, I mean, for architects. Uh, architects usually live long lives, um, many of them. I mean, let's think about it. Uh, Frank Gehry is uh, over 90. Kenneth Frampton was 90 just in December uh, or at the end of November. Peter Eisenman is 1988. Tosh is 93. Alvaro Siza around 93, 94. Architects live long lives, but unfortunately, Ruth died at 41. 41, that's, that's too early. But he was a very good architect. And uh, while he's not so well known, he deserves to be known. Uh, here he is with Daniel Burnham, uh, the one on the left, and on the right is Root. And they built some uh, significant uh, structures in Chicago, so very different from those in Great Britain by Philip Webb. Uh, I already read this. So uh, Granny's uh, block, 1880, Chicago, destroyed. Uh, at that time, Frank Lloyd Wright was, was, was already born and making waves for himself. Sullivan was still alive. Uh, I think Richardson died. Richardson, H.H. H. Richardson, uh, had an influence on Root. And it is said that there are actually three forefathers of the modern architecture in, in the United States. H.H. H. Richardson, Louis Sullivan, and Frank Lloyd Wright. But Root was influenced by H.H. H. Richardson, and we'll, we'll arrive at some pictures which show it clearly. This building was destroyed. We have just some, some illustrations uh, of it. But you see the scale of the building. I mean, you know, collective building is, is larger than what we have seen in the case of uh, Philip Webb. <clears throat> and also the architecture is very different. Gone are the, the sloping roofs. Gone are the, the chimneys. This is, a, uh, this is an architecture that announces almost the present. But before we arrive at some kind of similar buildings, uh, let's look at this church from 1880 in Chicago. Here, the influence of H.H. H. Richardson is, uh, is obvious because H.H. H. Richardson worked with brick in uh, this massive way you know, fortress-like architecture, which will be found also in the work of our uh, almost contemporary Uli Franzen, about whom I will talk after this one. So um, this, is, uh, this is a church built by uh, uh, Root. Uh, again, he, he built until 41 when he died. He built some, some, some uh, an impressive, uh, um, you know, uh, repertoire of buildings maybe not too many, but large buildings, important buildings in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in a city like Chicago uh, to build, uh, you know, uh, large scale buildings is not a, a little matter. But this church itself, yes, it's not as innovative as the churches of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, but uh, still I think it has something to say, especially now. So um, I, I think it has a slight touch of modernity, the tower itself. Otherwise the building, but because it, there is a certain simplicity of expression, uh, it, it is a virile uh, uh, 
you know, uh, building. Uh, it, it is not a building that uh, has too many hesitations. But I, I think it's, it, it's a legitimate building for a church. Now we arrive at uh, another building that was destroyed. I, let's see if I have a picture. I do. Uh, the same kind of uh, large scale uh, urban uh, building uh, built in Chicago and too bad that, um, that it was uh, de demolished. Uh, this one is a very famous building in Chicago and it, it was restored. Uh, it is a national historic landmark, but uh, um, not every building that he built had the, the, the fortune, uh, the, the good luck to be preserved like this one. And uh, in, in the context, uh, the, the, the Chicago urban context, it still stands out. Uh, it is 19th century, but it has force. It is, uh, it is uh, actively engaged with the uh, with, uh, with context. It is not as tall as the other buildings around it, but it still has presence. And, uh, you know, bravo to root. Uh, uh, yes, there is still historicism. Yes, there are still some uh, uh, relations, some references to the past. But uh, all in all, uh, it's still uh, a rather modern building. Uh, and uh, in the interior, there are very interesting things like this courtyard. Uh, and uh, even more, this, uh, this, uh, this ground floor uh, uh, large hall uh, where actually Frank Lloyd Wright uh, made a, 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 an intervention uh, that was uh, perhaps significant uh, here, and I don't have now uh, access to. Uh, there is you can find on the YouTube a very interesting. Actually, if you type in uh, his name, uh, the architect's name, uh, Britannica has a, a link to a, um, uh, to a video uh, that is very interesting about this building. I mean, I I could. Uh, I could actually, if you allow me to, to spontaneously, I plan to, to, to have this prepared, but I forgot, but I could open, uh, I could open uh, Britannica and we'll see this uh, little video, just a second please, because it's a very good discussion about this building with, a, with an architect. It's not a long uh, video, but it's an interesting one. Uh, okay, see. Uh, Britannica, John, uh, Wellborn, Root. I think it's this one. Let's see. I just watch it, and I, I, I plan to. I, I apologize. I plan to to have it uh, prepared. Uh, here it is. So uh, forgive me for uh, this slight uh, delay, uh, but it's, it's an interesting interview about this building. Uh, let's hope it works because sometimes uh, I hope you can hear correctly because when there is Zoom, Hoping
God, our color was no longer possible to have only one uh, separate program, which is also has a which is looked on. So when we look at the light court and deliberate, what were people wanting for me to What right has done is to press it up. We see the white paint, we see the gold roof, and we see the way the entire interior is brightened up. Okay, so we continue uh, the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this is a, indeed a, a very interesting case where an architect of some importance, Root, uh, meets, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And yeah, you can tell that there is an element of modernity here, a vigorous uh, creativity that uh, perhaps uh, Root was not yet capable of. Maybe he would have arrived at if he lived longer, but he created, Root created this, uh, this uh, space, uh, the, the ceiling, uh, the roof, uh, but the, the intervention of Frank Lloyd Wright in 1907 was significant as you hopefully you, you, you heard. I say hopefully because sometimes uh, when I play uh, YouTube, uh, or video materials on, on Zoom, uh, the sound is not so, so good. And if it was not so good, I apologize. Uh, I think it's brilliant that uh, that staircase in metal, which emerges from, a, from an architecture that is uh, almost its opposite. And uh, it, it's an accident, an aesthetical accident that is very, uh, uh, you know, stimulating uh architecturally so um this was built by root but uh was was uh reinterpreted everything uh, by uh, by the genius of Frankler Wright. um so the the commentator that we saw correctly underlined the, the conflict the tension between tradition and innovation between modernity and and uh, you know the, the seductiveness of the past but this, uh, this uh, staircase uh, is, is quite unique and I think very interesting and, and appealing for us as well. And uh, yes, the, the roofing as well is, is, uh, is, is brilliant. It, 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 is, uh, it, it is filtering light in a, in a poetical way. It is the, an embroidered uh, you know, uh, uh, roofing. It's very good, I think. An excellent work, and I'm very happy that uh, Root built it, and I'm very happy that Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, uh, you know, uh, contributed to this building, uh, one of the important buildings of the so-called past in, in in a city that is uh, notorious for its uh, promoting uh, modernity, and that is Chicago. I lived in Chicago for a number of years, so uh, I am uh, a little bit nostalgic myself at this moment. Uh, but um, 
uh, somehow the, 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 the force of Chicago in the 19th century uh, maybe is not, uh, is not uh, as much present today. It is very possible that the most important architect today in Chicago is actually a lady, uh, something would have been, that would have been inconceivable in the 19th century. But yes, Ginny Gang from Studio Gang is probably the most creative and the most innovative architect today in Chicago. And I, I suggest to you to check out her work. She has offices in Chicago, New York, Paris, and San Francisco. Maybe you already know the Agua Tower built by Ginny Gang, the studio gang. Uh, anyway, welcome to the ladies in architecture. Uh, it has been said, and I have a book actually published in France that with the title, uh, the 21st century, uh, uh, the women's century. It is the century of women, and it probably is. Even uh, at the University of Architecture here, there are more uh, female students than male students. Things are changing. Back to Root. I love this tale by, by Root and uh, uh, complemented by, the, by the, the vigorous creativity of uh, uh, the young uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Not too young, but still young. Uh, this man lived forever himself. He died in 92 or so. Anyway, this is a great building in Chicago. And uh, now we arrive at another, I don't know if I have pictures, uh, this was destroyed. Uh, yes, I do have some pictures. What a shame uh, that this building was destroyed. Uh, you know, yes, there is historicism, yes, maybe innovation is not, uh, um, you know, highly or alarmingly present, but it's a building with presence. And uh, I don't know for what reasons, probably speculative, uh, reasons of real estate, it was demolished. Well, uh, buildings, great buildings by Frank Lloyd Wright had been demolished as well, like the Larkin building. And uh, uh, it's just so sad, you know, to destroy uh, powerful, significant, uh, poetical buildings uh, that represent the art of architecture so well to be demolished. Like, for example, the Larkin building by Frank Lloyd Wright was threatened, was destroyed, was demolished in order to so-called build a parking lot. It's just unbelievable. And, and the Larkin building was truly a very significant structure built by, by Wright. But this building as well, it should have been saved and it was not saved. Uh, anyway, we move forward. Uh, Lakeview Presbyterian Church, 1888 uh, in Chicago. Uh, you know, maybe not a very impressive building, but it has a certain simplicity that points in the direction of modernity. Uh, otherwise, it's a rather you know, traditional uh, building. The interior is not very impressive. Uh, this is one of the spaces, I think it has several, uh, in, in some pictures, it appears to be larger, maybe some, some uh, uh, modifications took place. But even the interior is not uh, without interest. So, so somehow this, this picture, although in this case it's all about uh, benches, and in Biblioteca Laurentiana by Michelangelo is, uh, is about the, the, the desks. Uh, but somehow this picture makes me think of the Biblioteca Laurentiana, where uh, you have desks, also of massive wood, uh, a row of uh, massive desks. Uh, and uh, here we have a row uh, or two rows of, of massive uh, benches, almost sculpted benches. Now a building from 1889, uh, which was designated a national register of, uh, of historic uh, places. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tall building, again, so very different from the buildings by Philip Webb that we just saw at the beginning. The same place, at the same time, but Philip Webb in Great Britain, Root in Chicago. And uh, this was the brave new world uh, beginning to assert itself and the scale of its buildings 
do nothing else but uh, show this. Uh, these are large buildings. Again, try to imagine such a building in Europe in the 19th century. Uh, no, it would be hard to imagine something like this. But in Chicago, it, it was a different story. I mean, such a building, if you try to make an effort of imagination to, 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 to take this building and plant it in some European city, it would be as shocking as uh, Tour Eiffel was when it was built for Paris, no doubt. But in Chicago, which has many tall buildings, is one of the tall buildings. But it still has a, a level of modernity that is uh, almost striking, considering that oh, it was built in the 19th century, uh, not even uh, early in the 20th century. So bravo to Root. I mean, he worked together with Daniel Bonham. They had uh, a uh, fruitful uh, uh, partnership and uh, lots of commissions, uh, important buildings in an important city. The city of the winds. These are the plans uh, of, of the building. Very, if I am to use a common word, a very clean architecture, robust. Now, Society for Savings Building in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, no, this is, uh, I think Cleveland, uh, this, I don't know if this is in Ohio. It still looks like, uh, like Chicago. Maybe the avenue is called uh, or the street. Anyway, 1889, uh, another building that is kind of similar to an earlier building that we saw uh, by, by Root. And you see the influence of H.H. H. Richardson. Brick masonry walls, although behind them there is probably a steel structure. Uh, it's, it's massive, it's fortress-like. Uh, it has force. Even today, compared to the buildings nearby, uh, it has a presence that cannot be ignored. H.H. H. Richardson was very interesting, and he died also rather young, just like uh, Root uh, in his 40s. And uh, be he was very interesting because he, uh, he brought to the United States uh, a feeling of the, of the Romanesque uh, architecture. So he went even further back, uh, as opposed to Philippe Webb in, in Great Britain, who found uh, some inspiration in, 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 the, in the Middle Ages, in the Gothic, period, H.H. Uh, Richardson went uh, down on the spiral of time to the Romanesque architecture. And that's why his architecture was, uh, was uh, very robust, uh, fortress-like. And uh, Root uh, got inspired by H.H. H. Richardson. This is also a great uh, building in Chicago. Unfortunately, uh, Root uh, worked only on the ground floor and the basement together with his partner, Daniel Burnham, and I didn't find pictures of it. It's one of the, the, the most significant uh, tall buildings in, uh, uh, in Chicago, but it was built by another architect from the first floor up. Root and his partner worked just on the basement and the ground floor. That is a very interesting building because at uh, that time, uh, this was uh, unique. It was maybe the first building that employed such large pieces of glass. And you already had the feeling of what was to come in architecture, in the architecture of the tall building, and even in terms of uh, how it was uh, erected, as you can see here, uh, the structure. In fact, the structure uh, is, uh, is uh, lighter than, uh, if you look at the building, uh, from the outside, uh, uh, you don't quite get the, the feeling of how light and so-called modern uh, the structure was. Uh, this is the plan, sorry for the picture, it's probably not so relevant. But um, as I said, Root and uh, Daniel Burnham, they worked on the ground floor and the basement of this 
important building in Chicago. Now we arrive at a building that is just a depot uh, for the railway uh, business. Uh, that time in the 19th century, the railways in the United States uh, had uh, were in a way glorious. They were they were transporting people from one coast to the other. Uh, not any longer. Today, the trains in the United States are pathetic. I know what I'm saying because I live there. Uh, very, you know, uh, underprivileged people use the train and they are slow and uh, they are just not, uh, <laughs> they are not representing uh, any longer pride or, uh, you know, technological advancing advances. Uh, let's hope uh, Elon Musk will change things. But uh, the trains in the United States were really pathetic. I once took the train from New York to, to Denver, Colorado. Uh, it took me 48 hours. 48 hours. I mean, you know, this is uh, two days and two nights. Anyway. So this is a depot, a traditional building kind of, but it has vigor, it, it has, it, especially, in fact, strangely, in a way, this building uh, reminds one of the buildings we just saw by Philip Webb in Great Britain. And that's because of the, of the, of the uh, you know, sculpt, sculpturalness, if I am to uh, use this word, if there is such a word, of the roof. Uh, and the interior also, which is uh, modeled by the roof. I mean, this could have been almost a church, but it's a depot for the for the train station or for the you know the the trains. I don't know exactly what function it had, but is related was is related to the to the railways. Uh, you see the, the the trains nearby. Anyway. Um, I like these old pictures, and you see uh, a lot of trains there in the in, in the back. And, uh, yes, it was a pre 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 uh, prosperous uh, industry, uh, not any longer. But let's hope again that Elon Musk will change things, because I think uh, 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 collective transportation is important, and unfortunately, the automobile industry sabotaged. Uh, you know, also the airplanes industry sabotage the trains, so the trains struggle to remain alive. And this is probably the last picture of this presentation on, on route. Uh, you see the name of the architects, Burnham and Root, architects in Chicago from 1891. And unfortunately, as I said, Root died at 41. Okay, and now we go to a contemporary, almost contemporary architect whom I didn't announce in my, uh, in my invitation, uh, but whose birthday is actually today. And I am talking about Ulrich Franzen. Uh, I, I don't have a sufficiently developed presentation on him. He deserves more, but let's wish him happy birthday. I will show a few buildings by him. He was a... a an important uh, North American architect of the 20th century, uh, Ulrich Frenzen. Um, so he was a German born American architect known for his fortress like buildings and brutalist style. Uh, I mentioned the word fortress a, a few times uh, tonight uh, in relation with H.H. Uh, Richardson and uh, Root a little bit. Uh, in the case of Franzen, the fortress-like aesthetics uh, are even more obvious in some parts of his uh, architecture. Brutalism. Brutalism is, is, is coming back. It is seductive again. Uh, there was a large exhibition in Vienna two or three years ago called SOS uh, Brutalismus. Uh, uh, the brutalist aesthetic uh, is kind of a, a refreshing reaction to uh, minimalism, uh, to thinness and whiteness. Uh, I might even include here the, the, the newcomer Ishigami. Uh, the brutalists are indeed uh, uh, apparently brutal, but, but, but behind the, the apparent uh, um, uh, you know, roughness, I think sometimes, at least sometimes, there is a 
sensitiveness that is not rough at all. So uh, let's see what uh, Ulrich uh, Joseph Franzen did. I don't have, I only have a fragment of his buildings here, but there will be enough, I think, of an invitation to further study his work if you are attracted by his work. So he was born in Dusseldorf in Germany, uh, the son of these people. They emigrated to the United States in 1936. He lived with his mother and the younger brother once his parents divorced. He obtained an undergraduate degree from Williams College, an excellent college in the States. And after one semester at the architectural school at Harvard, he joined the army. After World War II ended, he obtained a master's degree from Harvard in 1950. By 1951, he was working for IM Pei. He left Pei and formed his own firm, Ulrich Franzen and Associates, in 1955. We'll start, uh, this is the man. I will show a few pictures with him. Uh, <laughs> do you notice those uh, marks on the carpet of his house of some piece of furniture? You know, it seems that even a German is unable to avoid the fatality of uh, uh, certain encounters between heavy pieces of furniture and a soft accommodating carpet. Anyway, this is the man. Uh, uh, he arrived at, 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 at uh, affluence. He made some money because he built a lot. Uh, and uh, so he was so-called very successful. I was still somehow interested in these marks in the, I mean, you know, I'm far from being uh, pretentious, but I'm surprised that Ulrich Franzen has allowed for something like this in his living room. Uh, anyway. Uh, so this is the man sitting uh, unconventionally in this way on the floor directly with a book or a magazine. Nice, a little bo bohemian touch uh, in the case of uh, one of the most successful architects in, uh, in the United States in the second half of the 20th century. We, we begin with his own house from 1956 uh, in, uh, in this place in, uh, in the state of New York. Uh, 1956, so, uh, you know, uh, almost 70 years ago, uh, um, you know, a modernistic uh, building, resolutely modern. Uh, unfortunately, he uses this kind of uh, uh, roofing uh, uh, in other buildings almost identically, and this is a little bit uh, disappointing, but uh, anyway. The building has, uh, has, uh, is, uh, is uh, interesting and uh, I think it, 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 it passes the test of time. Uh, a little bit, I just had this idea now, I, it makes me think a little bit of Fondation Le Corbusier in, in, in Zurich. Um, uh, Le Corbusier was, was more uh, free and more innovative. But uh, this kind, I guess it was in the air to have a, 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 you know, a, a roofing system that is supported in just a few parts, a few points almost uh, like this house that he built for himself in the woods of, uh, of New York. Not bad, uh, the, the setting at all. So we are far away from uh, Victorian architecture represented tonight by uh, Philippe Webb, the arts and crafts movement. We are far away from uh, John uh, Wellborn uh, Root, uh, Chicago, the 19th century. We are 100, almost 100 years later, a little bit less than 100 years later in the United States. The interior is indeed uh, mid-century modernist through and through, but it would, uh, it would uh, accommodate uh, the taste of today as well. In the foreground is the Vasily or the Kandinsky chair by Marcel Breuer. And uh, on the left, uh, some statuettes from Africa, perhaps uh, some of these people and friends and himself loved art and uh, you know, indulged in collecting um, artifacts from uh, various cultures and various times. Uh, and uh, 
but the plan if I'm not sure, but maybe, yes, maybe he used uh, the, the golden ratio. Uh, it does appear to be so, uh, judging on, on, the, on this uh, diagram, uh, but I don't know if, if these, uh, these uh, the, the, you know, references to the, to the golden uh, ratio were uh, his or some scholar afterwards but but the, the the golden triangle seems to 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 be at home so to speak in friends friends and uh, house own house interesting that he placed the bathrooms and the kitchen totally like an island within the at the very center of the house without windows on the walls uh, it's not so typical for a you know a private house in in the forest where he could have had windows for every single room. I guess life could be <laughs> easy and nice. No, I mean, if you contemplate this building, you wouldn't say that life is tough and uh, there are even uh, questionable or problematic aspects to it. No, uh, life could be uh, indeed quite nice. If I, if I look at this bedroom of Mr. Franzen. Anyway, um, we move forward. Another house from 1958, a beauty house. Uh, also uh, in, uh, in New York, uh, the state of New York, this one is, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the other one also had uh, the plan uh, rectangular, just like this one has. Very clean architecture, modern, uh, orthodox modernist, mid-century aesthetics, uh, and it was uh, advertised as, as such, uh, you know, uh, la joie de vivre, you know, the, the joy of being alive and uh, being, uh, you know, the husband at work in the business district of New York and uh, the wife with a friend having a nice time on the, on the, on the, uh, in the veranda or on the, anyway, outside of the house, enjoying the setting. Not bad. This is indeed a, an affluent uh, America, mid-century. Of course, there was a lot of poverty in America. And of course, there was a lot of discrimination. Uh, but uh, here we don't see something like this. These were published in Life magazine and it's uh, a promotion of modernity, of uh, opulence, of uh, you know the new aesthetics. And, uh, but uh, <laughs> this is uh, only part of the truth. There was uh, also an, uh, something else in the United States, less shown probably in, in life, in, in, in the magazine called Life. Um, so a party in the modern house by friends and sure, why not? Uh, people uh, laying even on some kind of, uh, I guess on the floor and on the, on the, on the, on the sofa and drinking uh, delicious, uh, orange juice or the juices or who knows what kind of juices. The good life, what can we say? There is even a piano, uh, as you can see. So uh, life indeed can be nice. 1959, the Weissmann house, but for this one, I couldn't find pictures. Uh, 1963, for this one also, I couldn't. But for Dana house, I did. 1963, Yukon and Connecticut, uh, more uh, monumental house if I can call it so, with uh, fortress-like walls, as uh, we already know that France and sometimes indulged in. Uh, but it's, it's still a correct architecture. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's kept under control, so to speak, because of the beautiful uh, uh, landscaping. And uh, yes, there is opulence, but it's not an impertinent architecture. It's still an architecture. Maybe it looks a little bit too institutional, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, you, you might wonder, it could, it could have been a, a small school or the, it's a private uh, residence. Uh, we even with large uh, surfaces of glass, uh, but, they, but they are complemented by the large opaque walls uh, of brick, 
Uh, and the interior, uh, this almost make me, makes me think of, 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 of some buildings, residential buildings by John Utson in Denmark. Uh, this linear, uh, cor I mean, this corridor and the, 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 the exposed brick, uh, you know, a clean aesthetics, a, a confidence, a confident modernism, and wood, of course, on the ceiling. Uh, so uh, what can we say? We, here was a German architect building convincingly in a modern key. Towers House in Essex, Connecticut, 1963. Uh, some, there was an article published about it with this question, a rhetorical question. Is this New England, because in, it is in New England, home too daring for the West? Well, the truth is the West experiments sometimes more than the East. If by the West, it depends what we mean by the West. In a few days, I will talk about a great architect from the West Coast, that is Tom Main from Morphosis, highly uh, avant-garde, if I am to use this word. And so the West uh, is it's not that um, you know uh, removed from from uh, avant-garde tendencies at all. But maybe here the word West refers to rather Midwest. But even, even in the Midwest, and we are going to uh, see actually interesting architecture from uh, Iowa or from, uh, in fact, it was said that while the avant-garde is on the East Coast or the West Coast, but the, the Midwest builds some, some of the dreams of those on the East Coast and the West Coast. Anyway, this is in New England and it's a building by uh, Ulrich Franzen. We see the roof. Uh, how it is, um, he, he, he used this idea several times and it worked, it worked. I guess he, he used this in order, this system to, to free the, the, the house of, of, of too much structural elements. So the, here it is an almost self-supporting roof of large dimensions and underneath he had a freedom to, um, uh, uh, envision the space he wanted to envision. Uh, sorry for the picture, you cannot read what's going on there, but you can see the building and you can imagine it. Uh, it's not so hard after all, it's, it's an orthodox modernism here, but it has qualities, it does. Uh, if I have any objection or uh, I don't know if I can call it objection, is the reappearance of the, of the same type of roof he used uh, approximately uh, the same in, in his own house that we saw at the beginning. Now, <laughs> it's not a castle, it's just called the Castle House from 1964, and it's not in London, but New London in Connecticut. It's actually a modern house, and um, you know, uh, what can we say? Uh, there were many houses built like this, but this was built by Franzen. Now we, 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 see, we see a house he built for himself, but 20 years after he built the first one that we saw. And this is interesting. We see the same architect at different times in his life, a uh, difference of 20 years. We saw the first house he built in 1959, I think, in 1950s. This one, 20 years later, also for himself in the uh, highly fashionable uh, Bridgehampton, New York. And uh, yeah, this one looks, uh, at least from this side, uh, futuristic, almost science fiction. Uh, it's clean, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, polished and, uh, and uh, high tech. From this side, because you would be surprised. In fact, you would, be, you would expect something else looking at this facade. The building uh, in its uh, wholeness is uh, not what this facade uh, suggests. But this facade is uh, it's, uh, interesting and engaging uh, even today. Uh, and uh, he was doing well, obviously, to build in Bridgehampton is not, uh, uh, it's not an easy matter. You have to have a lot of money. East Hampton, Bridgehampton and Southampton are uh, uh, places that are extremely expensive and uh, 
Anyway, so you see the house from the air. Uh, uh, we saw the facade, uh, this facade, but otherwise the building is, uh, so he, I personally expected to see a very different building uh, than, than how it, it looks like uh, from, from the air and how it is. Otherwise, the interior is uh, is still very modern, uh, you know, uh, high end modernist, but from well, not too long ago, uh, you know, uh, a little more than forty years ago. Uh, Postmodernism was already beginning to enter the scene, so to speak, but Ulrich Fernsen remained to a resolutely modern architectural language, and I think he was wise uh, doing so. Uh, well, it is said that uh, the shoemaker doesn't make shoes for himself, and maybe some architects uh, don't uh, build for themselves very convincingly. This was not the case of Ulrich Fanson. He loved to build for himself, something that Louis Kahn didn't. Louis Kahn, for example, didn't build a house for himself. In fact, when he died, he died in debt, great debt, so much debt, in fact, that his wife um, had to sell furniture from his office and drawings and so on to pay the debt. Anyway, but he did so because he, he worked for uh, DACA, uh, where he paid his employees to study uh, various aspects of the great uh, architectural uh, uh, complex of buildings he was building in Dhaka uh, beyond what he was paid by the by the client he might not it's possible he was not even paid because uh, as, a, as a friend of ours he on zoom uh, an Indian architect from Ahmedabad no no I'm sorry it wasn't him who told us I've I've heard uh, Doshi who received the Pritzker Prize in architecture saying that neither Le Corbusier nor Khan were paid for what they built in Ahmedabad in India. So it's very possible that, uh, you know, they accepted the commissions in Ahmedabad or Dhaka without being paid a lot, or maybe not even being paid. So this might explain what Khan never built a house for himself and he died in debt. Sorry for this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, intermezzo. So now we arrive at, uh, we are approaching the end of this presentation and, and he does deserve more. And I apologize that I didn't uh, uh, um, accelerate my effort to, to present more of his works, but this is an introduction. We arrive at a very important work by him, this theater in Houston, Texas from 1968, which is indeed a modern fortress. Look at this. It is a fortress that uh, fortress for culture, and and maybe uh, and, and maybe more than maybe uh, culture does need to be fortress like. I remember Tadao Ando uh, launching a competition. He was also the evaluator, the judge of that competition in Japan some some years ago for a bulwark of resistance, a bulwark of resistance. Perhaps culture needs to 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 engage itself into, into, into in a way, a, a, a war with commercialism, with a, a mercantile interest, and as such, it needs to defend itself like a fortress. And uh, I, 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 I imagine uh, uh, even today, or maybe even more today, culture needs to, it's about resistance through culture. Uh, so, the idea to have a, a theater, a forest-like, fortress-like. Uh, I, I don't think Franzen was uh, necessarily animated by these thoughts, but I'm thinking about the relevance of a cultural building today that, it, that looks like a fortress. It could symbolize, it could be a metaphor for, for, for that resistance, that bulwark of resistance, that culture, uh, needs to be in order to survive or to even assert itself uh, sufficiently. Uh, because we are assaulted by commercialists, by big companies, by big business, by real estate manipulations, by all kinds of things. And of course, uh, of prime importance is the obsession with money, 
money and money and not spirit or culture or poetry or music and so on. Uh, we transformed even music into an industry today. That's why even musicians talk about the music industry, the literature industry, even education became an industry. As such, I think culture needs to uh, find refuge in itself for this life. Anyway, sorry for, uh, for this um, uh, you know, promotion of a certain idea, but um, coming back to the building by friends and uh, we see indeed a heroic building, maybe not too hero heroic because it has some mundane elements, but it is, it is fortress-like and uh, a luminous fortress, if I can say so. It's a theater, but it, it has uh, the aesthetics of, uh, of, uh, uh, of um, a certain uh, uh, mental disposition that maybe is not so uh, common any longer. Um, uh, the belief in, 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 in the massive walls uh, and uh, you know, a massive structure is not so much ours any longer. And, 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 and the exposed concrete uh, makes uh, this uh, uh, even more uh, obvious. But if you compare it with the building behind or on the right, which is much taller, it's rather, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a fragile building, but it's a smaller building, almost more vulnerable and uh, as such, if it has the qualities of a fortress, uh, or fort being fortress-like is, is, uh, is not so bad. It's still a, an interesting uh, building. I'm not so sure about those uh, advertisings uh, that I guess are necessary, but they create a little bit of uh, visual um, chaos for my taste. Here, it's less obvious uh, at night. And now we arrive at the last building by him uh, uh, in this presentation, maybe next year uh, on his birthday, the 15th of January, I will amplify this material. Uh, 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 a large building by the, the, the manufacturer of a, of a famous uh, cigarette. Now uh, cigarettes are, uh, and smoking are almost banished. I mean, they exist, but uh, less and less people smoke. But at that time in 1984, I remember I used to buy a, a pack of uh, Marlboro with 60 cents. Now it's more than 10 times more expensive. It's, it's more than $7. At that time was, uh, as I said, less than $1. Philip Morris made a lot of money selling cigarettes. I don't know, maybe it's possible they are bankrupt now. I don't even know if this brand still exists exist, but at that time they had the, 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 the money to, to commission um, uh, Ulrich Franzen to build their headquarters. And the headquarters is a headquarters indeed. I mean, you know, it's almost hard to believe that a manufacturer of cigarettes can afford such a, such a triumphant uh, building, uh, but they did. Uh, and yes, they, they made a lot of money. Now the same amount of money, if not more, is made by the uh, communication industries, you know, Vodafone, Orange, and so on. They, they make so much money with the so-called uh, communication age. Uh, here on the right, you see the Panam building. It was still called the Panam building, built by uh, Walter Gropius. Panam ran out of business, uh, an airline uh, industry, uh, and uh, now it's called MetLife, I think. So this building that you see, barely see here, was done by uh, Walter Gropius, who at the time when he built this was running, was the director of the uh, department of design, the, the school, uh, the graduate school of design at Harvard. Okay, so the fortress like uh, <laughs> was built with the money uh, obtained from uh, selling the very fragile uh, cigarettes, but very lucrative business. As you can see, uh, it's a commercial building, let's face it. It's not a cultural building. Uh, and it's actually even a little bit less fortress like because it is a building that uh, celebrates capitalism. It was born from capitalism, and uh, maybe capitalism will also make it collapse. 
uh, here it is. Uh, not quite a skyscraper, but uh, moving towards becoming one to an extent. And we end actually, I end with also a Philip Morris building, but a different building. I think I have just two images or three. The research center, which was also built by Ulrich Franzen. And this is not a bad building, it's interesting, it's intriguing. It, it has, uh, I don't know, aesthetical connotations that make me think of something else, not a research center for a manufacturer of very fragile little cigarettes. But uh, <laughs> that's what it is. It is in a way uh, funny, I, I, I would say that uh, a manufacturer of cigarettes uh, indulged in, 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 in this kind of architecture, you know, almost with the, some kind of cosmic longings, or I, I don't know. It almost could have been some kind of a religious build, but it's not. It's a research center for uh, <laughs> making cigarettes uh, easier and easier and uh, cheaper and cheaper in order to sell them with a bigger and bigger price. Welcome to capitalism. Welcome to making a profit. In capitalism, if you don't make a profit, you are seen. And if you make a profit, you are safe. Thank you.